the next lecture is about edge detection and we will see how we are going to make use of uh, all the filtering operations we have studied uh, studied in the last lecture uh, let me quickly go over the uh, outline what all we are going to uh, cover in this lecture first of all we'll try to understand what exactly is edge detection and some motivation why we need to perform edge detection then we will look into some of the challenges which we face and the most important is noise uh, what will happen if uh, there is noise present in the image uh, how that will affect like your edge detection algorithms or your schemes you're you're you're, you're, you're using and then we will go over a few algorithms which are used to perform edge detection and some of these are very old algorithms like decade decades old but we will see like still they are uh, being used today and how they are very effective so these are Privet, uh, then Sobel, uh, Marhelrith, and then finally Kenny edge detection. Okay, so let's start with uh, the basics of edge detection. Now, uh, we were talking about image derivatives and we saw that if we use image derivatives on, on like any image patch, it was giving us a sense of how the values are changing, how the pixel values are changing in that image. Okay, so that's the sole idea of detecting edges so if you have certain changes in your image if the pixel values is changing then you consider that as an edge and if the value is not changing it's smooth then you don't have any edge and if you think about like uh, how you visualize your images that's exactly what happens near the edges in your images when you have some shape or some objects the value of the color or you can say the pixel value actually changes and why this is uh, important in this will give you like some kind of semantic or shape information for example if you perform edge detection in an image it will just give you the boundary of that object right and another interesting uh, way to look into this is if you if you have an image it will have a lot of pixels and if you have to store that image I mean for each pixel you will have to store if it's an rgb colored image you will have to store three values right and that might be too expensive like the in terms of uh, the amount of memory it will require but instead if we just compute edges in that image which also gives us a sense of like what object is present because it is giving you the shape information or, or the boundary information right in that case you only have to save like where edge is present and where edge is not present which is like very very uh less expensive in comparison to storing all the pixel values all right so let me give you a very simple example of uh, edge detection what it looks like this is again the standard image which we have been using so this is the input grayscale image and after performing edge detection we will have something like this and here you can see that uh, all these lines or you can see like all the pixel values which are uh, highly active or which have higher value are the edges so they are representing edges present in this image and by just looking at this image you can make a sense of like okay this looks like a girl there is a hat and maybe some background objects uh, of, of this boundary. So you still preserve some semantic information there. Of course, you are losing a lot uh, of texture and all that because you, you don't have like a uh, pixel level information preserved here. Okay, so that's how like uh, it will look like after you perform edge detection. And you can see that at the boundary of the cap, like uh, the pixel, pixel values uh, must be changing because you are seeing like different gray levels here, right? And that is causing to uh, causing this edge to be formed here so you can see like you can clearly define the seams like a cap to you just by looking at the edges okay now so that was one example uh now why we observe edges in images let's try to understand that uh what are the different factors which are actually responsible to form these edges so the first kind of edges uh could be like the surface normal might be changing, right? For example, if you look at this location, so if you look at just the surface, then the surface normal is actually coming uh, coming towards you, right? At, at this location, it's coming towards you. So it's like in some kind of horizontal plane. So if you draw normal, it's coming outside. But suddenly, if you move to the top of this cap, the surface normal is actually pointing upwards. Right? So at this location, you can see that the surface normal is actually changing. It's going from like in the horizontal direction to the vertical direction. And whenever you will see that the surface normal is changing, you will observe some kind of edges there. And that's why we have this edge. Okay. 
The other reason could be you have discontinuity in depth. And if you look at this location, so this pixel value belongs to this uh, bottle. And on the right, that's kind of a background. So if there is a background and there is an object, then of course there will be difference of difference in the depth. So whenever there is a difference in the depth, in the depth, you will observe some edges. Okay. Now that's not like the only reason you will have edges. It could be like there is no difference in the depth, but still you might observe some uh, some edges. So that is the example, and this is like the change in the surface color. So the depth is not changing. The depth is same, but you can see like because like the text over here which is written on this bottle, the pixel values are, or the colors is, are actually changing, right? And uh, that that uh, letter there is causing actually this edge. So it doesn't always have to be depth. And also like, if you look at this, the surface normal is also not changing. And like, there, again, there are a lot of other factors. Another uh, factor which you can discuss is the illumination discontinuity. For example, if you look at this location here, if this bottle is placed on a on a table, right? So if you look at this table, I mean it's still the table, and which means the depth will not change, the surface normal will not change, and of, of course, like the surface color is not going to change because the color might be uniform on the tip on, on the tabletop, right? It's just there's a shadow coming from this bottle, which is causing this uh, this edge over here. So this is coming from the discontinuity in the elimination. Okay, so there are a lot of different factors which are causing these edges. Now let's try to understand how we can model these edges. Uh, there are again, uh, three different phases we'll try to cover. So the first type of edge is step edge. Okay. So step edge is like, you will have like some continuous value in the pixel color and it suddenly change. It changes to like some other value. And again, it remains the same. So this is kind of, a, if, you, if you recall from the uh, previous lecture, like we were talking about uniform distribution where we had the step function. So this looks exactly like a step function and this is called a step edge. Some other edges could be not, they, they might not be this sharp. There might be some continuity there and these are called ramp edges. And what's happening here is when we are changing levels uh, between these colors, so again, you're going from this level to this level, right? which is exactly the same as uh, this scenario here. The only different difference is you are not doing that abruptly as a step. You are doing that like in, in some continuous fashion. So it's, it's increasing gradually. Okay, so this is called ramp edge. The other kind of edge is like roof edge. And this is slightly different from these two edges. In this case, like your pixel value is low it's increasing and then again, it's coming back to the original value. So it's increasing and coming down. So it's kind of forming a roof and that is causing this edge. Okay, so these are three different models. Now, uh, the, uh, one of the question like which uh, we should uh, try to answer is, okay, all right, that's fine. Those are edges. The reasons we understood why they are forming. We try to understand different models but why extracting these edges is important. We, we try to cover that uh, briefly when we talk about it can reduce the memory consumption to save your images, but still preserve some information. But that was just one use. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, different applications where edge detection can be useful. So you can use like maybe object recognition as a downstream task. So you can extract edges from the images and use that for recognition. Right? You can use it for like recovering some kind of geometry so for example, like if you have uh, an image and there's some occlusion, right? So if, if you just uh, try to extrapolate edges or you have some kind of prior knowledge, so you can try to recover those objects. So that could be one uh, interesting application. And the reason is like, again, so these are, these, these images are just showing you edges over here. I mean, you don't have any pixel values. You don't know what color uh, we have, what kind of texture we have. It's just like edges, right? And still as a human, we can say that this is a plane, this is a house, and this is maybe a mouth, uh, tongue sticking out and nose and an eye, okay? So, which means that edges are powerful and they can be used for like a lot of different applications in computer vision without even using like the color values. Okay, so 
now we 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 talked about that motivation which is good now let's uh, have a let's have a very close look at the actual images and what does like having an uh, edge uh, really means so this is an uh, original input rgb image and this is let's focus let's focus on this particular patch over here so if you zoom in on this it will look something like this and you can see here that uh, there are like multiple edges and these are vertical edges right this is the first this is the first actually this is not even visible here but this is an edge and i think this is the surface surface normal is actually changing and again we have an edge here uh, this could be like illumination due to different lighting conditions and again this is different lighting condition or the surface normal might be changing it might be like both might be happening at the same time okay so we have all these edges here now again we have an edge over here this is again the surface normal is changing but again the lighting condition is also different which is causing like the pixel values to change and this is like interesting the surface normal is not changing at all the the illumination is also not changing it's uniform it's because of the texture which is there uh, at this location right so that's why we have all these edges now as we discussed earlier like edge is something where the image intensity or the image pixel value is changing okay so and again this is like a uh, an example of roof edge which we discussed earlier the pixel value is changing then again it's coming down now if you try to slice uh, a single row from this image patch and try to plot that as a uh, as a one dimensional function so we, we talked about like the intensity profiling right so let's say we draw intensity profile of this uh, with this row so it will look something like this because starting from the left it's all white very high uh, it's kind of bright pixel so the values will be high and suddenly you can see that there's an edge and it's become, becoming darker so it will go down and then it stays the same this corresponds to the center location here and again it will rise and it stays the same as the initial level okay so if you draw this intensity prof intensity profile of the this particular row from this patch it will look something like this now by just looking at this you can say that okay i mean we have a sense of where the edges are present we can say that okay i mean the the pixel values are changing here so definitely there is an edge and we can say that uh, pixel values are changing there is an edge okay so let's try to see like how we can um, extract these edges automatically Considering this as a one dimensional function, if you compute first order derivative of this function, you will get something like this. I will, I will walk you through like how we get this plot. Starting from the left. So first, just a quick recap. Let's uh, walk through like how we can uh, get first order derivative of uh, this function, which is coming from this image patch. And just a quick recap, uh, derivative is just computing whether the function value is changing or not. Okay, so that's exactly what uh, first order derivative was. So we start if we start uh, from the left and we start moving right. So for each consecutive locations, we will compute whether the value is changing or not. So we can see value is not changing. So the derivative is zero, right? So this is the zero level and it will remain zero until we reach this point. Okay, so this is zero. And as we move forward, we can see the value is actually going down. So if you compute the difference, it's going to be a negative value. And as you keep moving, you can see that the slope is actually increasing. And you also know that from your high school maths, derivative kinds of also reflects what is the slope of your function at any given point. Okay. So if you if you if you know that, then you know that the slope was actually zero when we started, and the slope is actually increasing. And if the slope is increasing, it's, it's going in the negative direction, which is fine. That's why we are going in the negative direction. And at this location, when we reach here, it's kind of the maximum slope, which we are observing. And this location is exactly at this point. Then if you will draw like the tangent to this curve, tangent again gives you the slope. So this tangent, the value will be maximum, the absolute value, all right? And again, as we move, move forward, the slope of that tangent will again gradually start decreasing like this. 
and it will be exactly the replica of what we, what we observed uh, before this point. And again, this is the slope was like this. It was increasing. It became maximum, and then it again coming back. All right. So that's the maximum. Again, it's coming back. So it will again come to zero. And this point is at this location when again the values are not changing at all. So the derivative stays zero. Okay. And again, you can repeat the same process for this curve. And again, this is actually increasing. So your slope is positive. And that's why you get the same kind of bump, but it's in the positive direction. Okay. So that's how you compute first order derivative of this uh, simple intensity uh, profiling. And if you look at this, by looking at this curve, we, we knew that, okay, this is an edge and this is an edge, but we didn't know like how to automatically compute that. But after computing first order derivative, looking at this, you can easily automate this. You can say that, okay, whenever there is a dip or whenever like we see like a hill, that that's an edge and which, which is actually true. So this edge over here belongs to this vertical edge and this edge over here belongs to this vertical edge. Okay, so which means that first order derivative actually helps you in computing edges in your images. So these two peaks are, are kind of indicating uh, where the edges are. So, so far so good, but let's see like what's the issue with this simple process because if this is it, then we don't have to do anything, right? It's a very, very simple process, but that's actually not true. Now, let's try to closely study like the intensity profile of uh, this image. And as we go from left to right, this is the intensity profile. It kind of remains the same. It goes down. And at this point, you can see it's going down because we have kind of a dark background here, right? So it go, goes down and again, it, it comes up. So this is kind of a more realistic uh, intensity profile from a real world image. And you can see that it's not very smooth. There are a lot of like uh, jerks here, a lo lot of ups and downs. But still we can see that whenever the intensity is changing, we do see these dips. And these are kind of indication where the edges are present. So let's compute derivative of this intensity profile. Uh, I won't go through like uh, all of this, but you can like do yourself and you know like how to, how to get these peaks, right? So this is the first one you can see here. And again, so all these peaks, they are kind of representing whenever there was a sudden change in the intensity values. And if you look at the, uh, the intensity derivative, and if you look back at this image, so each of these peak is actually corresponding to the edges present at these locations. Okay, so far so good. Now let's try to add a little bit of noise like in your images, in your image. And usually we know that images are actually noisy. So let's add like a little of a little bit of Gaussian noise and see what happens. Now, what will happen is if you have noise, you know that it comes from like a probability, for example, if it's a Gaussian noise. So each pixel will have some value added, right? Or maybe subtracted. And if you, let's say, add Gaussian noise on this image, then the intensity profile is going to look like this. And uh, no, so this is the intensity derivative. And here you can see that, okay, the edges uh, which you were uh, observing earlier, they are kind of gone, right? So you are seeing like a lot of peaks here. All of these are peaks. Of course, you have like higher peaks, which is fine, but you do have like shorter peaks as well. So now the question is, if we observe that many peaks, I mean, of course, those are not edges, right? Those peaks are there because of noise, because due to noise, like your pixel values are actually changing in the local neighborhood. And that's why it's hindering you from computing the actual edges. Okay, so this is a simple function. Again, this consider this as like intensity profile coming from an image. And uh, you can see like there's a lot of fluctuation in the signal, which is again coming from noise. Okay. Now, if you compute a uh, derivative, as I showed you earlier from a real example, even for this function, this is what like a first order derivative will look like. And at each location, since the pixel values actually intensity is changing, you will get a lot of, lot of peaks. Whenever it's changing, you will get a peak. And with this kind of signal mean, you can't say where the edge is present. So let's try to see uh, what, uh, what, what can be like a simple solution to uh, resolve this.
Okay, so all this is fine. We we talked about that. We can actually smooth our uh, signal using some kind of filtering. Okay, and smoothing, you know, we have seen like box filter. We we have seen Gaussian filter. All those filters help you in smoothing your signal. And when you smooth your signal, what it does is it tries to utilize the neighborhood values and then use the average and replace the value of the current pixel, right, in, in your image. And it will do the same for the signals as well. So if you smooth, let's say in this case, we are using a Gaussian uh, filter. A Gaussian filter will look something like this, which means that uh, you are paying more attention to the current pixel, slightly less attention to the neighboring pixels, but you're still looking at the neighborhood. So it will have some kind of smoothing effect. And if you perform filtering using this Gaussian kernel of this function, then this is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, filtering operation. And you can see that the signal becomes something like this. So all the noise is actually gone. So filtering using Gaussian is helping you in getting rid of uh, the noise which, which was there. And then what you can do is you can just compute derivative of this uh, filtered uh, signal. Right. So if you compute derivative, it will give you something like this. And this bump over here actually corresponds to this change in uh, signal intensity, which represents an edge. Okay, so smoothing is like a one operation which helps you in helps you uh, to, to address noise and still be able to compute edges in your signal or in your in your images. Now there is like some optimization which you can perform here. Uh, and we'll talk about optimization a lot when we when we talk about filtering on edge detection later on. So if you look at this uh, operation, right? So this is, uh, uh, this is a filtering or you can say correlation operation, right? And you're computing derivative of this function. And we have seen that uh, if you compute derivative, it's kind of, uh, you can compute derivative of the filter itself right and then apply that uh, apply that to to the filter so so this was this was the original uh, filtering operation and you are computing the derivative right so you can bring out like the the function itself and just find the derivative of your kernel okay because convolution is differentiable we i think uh, saw that in one of the properties in the last lecture now why this is important because your function or your signal or your image that is going to change but you beforehand know what your filter is going to be and if you know that you can compute the derivative beforehand okay you don't have to wait for the signal itself so for example if our uh, if, if our filter was gaussian then what we can do is we can just compute the derivative of the gaussian and that derivative is not going to change at all and what we can do is then use that derivative of gaussian to actually perform filtering all right. So if you compute derivative of your Gaussian, uh, you will get something like this. And uh, I can go over this quickly, uh, but I, I don't think there's a lot uh, to, uh, to understand here. So your Gaussian will look something like this, right? So when you're computing the derivative, again, you can see that uh, your signal value is actually increasing. Again, we can just follow the slope. Initially, the slope is zero and it's gradually increasing. And the slope will be maximum when you are at this location. Right, so that corresponds to this value. But again, the slope is going to come down. And as you reach the top, the peak over here, again, your slope is zero, which corresponds to this location. And again, you can repeat the same thing for the other half of the Gaussian, but again, it's in the different direction. So you get like a, a peak uh, towards the negative direction, right? So that's the, uh, the uh, differentiation of a Gaussian function. And now what you can do is use this uh, kernel to perform filtering and the result is not going to change. You will get exactly what you got using like these three steps, okay? So you're saving like one step here. So that's kind of optimization. All right, so uh, we discussed like smoothing health, but again, it's really important to understand. Uh, we also saw that in, in the last lecture, it, it actually depends what kind of filter you're using and like what's the size of your filter and that will completely change the kind of output you are getting. So you can ha just have like, uh, you can just use one pixel, which means you're not changing anything. You can use, let's say, smoothing over three pixels. It could be a three cross three kernel. 
then you will see that uh, the edges are actually also getting blurred. And if you keep increasing the size of the kernel, uh, it's going to be even blurry. Okay, so which means that if you do too much smoothing, I mean, of course, it will remove the noise, but again, you're losing on, on, on some of the edges as well. So if you will have like very soft edges, all those edges might be gone just using smoothing. So if you, if you want to recover those edges, then smoothing might not be a good idea. Okay. Now let's quickly go through how an edge detection algorithm can be evaluated because we want to automate this. So far we have, we are just talking about by just visual inspection. Okay. This edge detection seems good. This is not good, but we should have like a computational way or like a, a quantitative metric to compute how good our edges are. So we'll briefly talk about that. And uh, this again, you might, uh, if you have taken machine learning course or any statistics course, you might know like uh, what recall is, what precision is. So we'll um, quickly go over this. Now, let's say this uh, circle over here represents all the edges, which your method is actually saying uh, are edges. All right, so this is kind of results from your method. The red one is, let's say the ground truth. So this is the set of actual edges. So if you will quickly, quickly look at this, you can see that you are saying all these are edges, but again, this is at a conceptual level. I mean, we don't have any edges here, right? So this is just like, just like the set of edges we have. So this is the area where we are saying there are edges, but they were actually not ground truth. And this, the center one is like the edges, which were actually the edges. And our method also said like it's, it's edges. And these are all the edges which were actually edges, but our method actually was not able to recognize these as edges. Okay, so we have terms for all these. The center one we call true positive because our method said it's, a, it's an edge and it was actually an edge. Okay, so that's true positive. Then true negative, these, all these were not edges. These are like outside your uh, red circle, right? And our method also said these are not edges. So these are negatives, but true negatives. Then the uh, next one is false positive. So false positive, this region where our method said these are edges, but these were not actually edges because these are like outside the red circle, right? So we call them false positive because our method is saying these are positive, but actually these are not positive. So false positive, okay? And last one is false negative, which again, it's the same uh, scenario as false positive. So our method said these are negative, because we don't recognize these are uh, edges, but these were actually edges because these are inside the red circuit. So we call these false negatives. So once you understand like all uh, these terms, you can easily compute precision and recall. And these are the formula. I will just give you the intuition. We'll not go over the equation. You might know uh, already uh, know this. So precision is how correct your method is. All right. So if your method is saying something is an edge, so is that correct or not? So that tells you about precision, all right? And that's exactly what uh, is being shown here, true positive over the results of method, right? So for example, your method said 100 of these were edges, right? So that's the result, but actually only 50 of them were edges. So that will be true positive. So then your precision will be 0.5, or you can say 50%. Okay, so it's about like what your method is saying and how much of that is correct. That's precision. Recall is slightly different. Recall tells you if there were, let's say, thousand edges, then out of those thousand edges, how many of edges your method was able to detect? Right. So it's you can see like it's kind of recalling what is an edge and what is an not what is not an edge. So if you look at this formula over here, it says true positive over ground truth. All right. So let's say the ground truth you had thousand edges. All right. And true positive, your method only could detect 50 edges which were correct, which means that out of 1,000, your method only predicted 50 edges. So the recall will be 50 over 1,000, just 5%. Okay, so that's like the slight difference between precision and recall. So precision is how accurate your method is, kind of, and recall is like how much of, uh, how much of it the method can actually recall or, or collect. All right. So you, you compute like precision and recall, and uh, then you create a plot, which is called like precision, uh, recall over precision. I will show uh, dot, that plot later. 
uh, which is actually useful to compare different algorithms. Now, uh, a good edge detection algorithm will actually find all the real edges, all right, and it will try to ignore noise and other artifacts. And not only that, it should also try to localize it well. So what, what I mean, uh, mean by that, for example, this is a true edge and your method is giving something like this. So it's not like localizing it well, although it's detecting edges, but it's not localized, right? Again, this is like slightly better, but again, the locations are not correct. And in this case, you can see like this bar over here, if this is representing the red one, then it's actually giving you the correct edge but it's kind of too many responses, right? So it's over predicting. Now, looking back at precision and recall, in this case, you might get a good precision because it could be like three of these are correct and two are incorrect. So the precision will be three over five. In this case, let's say this is the correct edge. So in this case, the precision is actually better than this. The precision will be two over four because these two are correct and the total are four, which the method predicted, right? And again, you can compute recall as well. So if you look at recall, recall will be best for this method because it's actually detecting all the edges, right? But if you look at the precision, precision is going to be pretty bad because it's predicting like uh, these three and these three, six extra edges, which were not there in the ground truth. All right, so that gives you a sense of what precision and recall uh, means when you perform edge detection. Now, what you do is you have that recall, you have that precision, and you vary your threshold, which is like kind of saying this is an edge or not. So you, you will have that threshold. So if you vary that, then eventually like you, you can get this kind of curve. And the idea here is if you have like a very high threshold, which means you are predicting very, very, very few edges. So recall is zero. In that case, I mean, if you're predicting few, of course your precision should be high, right? Because if let's say you're not predicting anything, it's zero, then your precision is kind of, you can say like perfect, you are not, never wrong. Okay, so that's why the curve starts uh, from the top here. And then as you lower the threshold, which means that you are trying to predict more edges, so some of them will be wrong, then your precision will fall. But since you're collecting more edges, your recall is going to improve. And eventually, if you say like, you say the whole image is an edge, then your recall will be perfect, 100%. But then your precision will go down because most of them will be wrong. Okay, so that's how this uh, curve is plotted. And uh, these are like methods, some of these algorithms we are going to discuss. The green dot over here, that's le uh, like human level performance. And these are various algorithms. Uh, we are going to start with Privet and Sobel, which are right here, you can see like, around 68 and 70, right? 1968, so 30, 40 uh, years back. And you, you might say that, okay, this is like, uh, we will study it like almost a similar kind of algorithm, but with a gap of two years. So for today, that seems weird, but if you think about like how it worked, used to be worked like uh, back then, it, we didn't have internet anything, right? So you perform some research, then you had to mail like that paper, even printing was not possible. Sometimes it's like handwritten notes, so just communicating your research was like a year long process, even more than that. So it might happen that uh, both the researchers were not aware of like each other's work. But today it's like you did something, you just publish online, it's out there right, immediately. So it's, it's quite different, which is actually good. This lecture, we will uh, talk about uh, Privet and Sobel edge detection. So this is continuation of our last lecture where we were talking about edge detection. And we have already covered like uh, the background which is required to perform edge detection. And uh, we will be covering four different algorithms which will be used to uh, do edge detection. So we'll start with Privet and Sobel Edge. And then later on, we'll move to Kenny edge detection. And we have one more, uh, Mar Hill uh, edge detection. Okay, so let, let's begin. Basically, uh, Privet and Sobel both of these edge detectors, they are almost similar. There is a very slight variation between these two. And so the, the filters which we use for performing uh, edge detection in these two algorithms, they, the filters are different, but the steps are exactly the same. Okay? Now, the whole algorithm, we can just uh, list that, uh, that as uh, a set of these steps. 
the first step is we'll compute derivatives of, of your input image and we'll compute in x direction in y direction and we, once we have these uh, derivatives we'll compute the magnitude we, we we studied last lecture like how we can compute a magnitude of a gradient and then we will use a threshold uh, on these uh, on these gradient magnitudes which will decide whether it's an edge or not okay so these are like the basic three steps which will be used in both these algorithms and all this like uh, this process we have already covered like using uh, several other filters uh, in, in the previous lecture okay so let's do a quick recap uh, before we uh, go into the algorithm itself now we, we talked about how we can convert continuous uh, derivatives to discrete derivatives and we talked about three different variations where we have backward difference we have forward difference and then we have central difference and we also saw that how we can represent these three different filters as a derivative mass okay so for backward difference we have a negative one and one uh, the second one is a forward difference and third one is a central difference and we know that if we use these filters uh, these filters to perform filtering on any input image these are going to give us derivatives of of that image all right so those filters of which we just saw they were one dimensional filters but images actually in 2d space so what we'll have to do is we'll have to compute derivative in two different dimensions and there we uh, saw last time that how we can compute gradient vector which is again uh, it, it looks fancy but if you think about this it's just partial derivative in these directions independently and we just put these two derivatives as a vector okay and once we have this we can compute gradient magnitude we will see how this is useful in determining whether it's an edge or not and we can also compute a gradient direction and there were a couple of questions I think uh, from some of you asking whether this equation is wrong uh, is wrong and so f y over fx is also fine the the idea here is we want to compute the orientation of the edge or you can say uh, the direction of the gradient and if we switch like between fx and fy of course it will give you a different value but again both two are like dependent on each other if you have orientation using fx over fy you can easily subtract that maybe if it's uh, if it's in degrees you can subtract that from 90 that will give you the value which you're going to get using fy over fx right so it's just a representation and if you're computing fx over fy it means you are computing the orientation with respect to the y-axis and if you compute fy over fx again it will be the orientation but but uh, with respect to x-axis so that's the only difference all right so it doesn't matter like uh, how you compute it but whatever you do be consistent in like all the steps you are using throughout your algorithm and then we saw a very a simple uh, sample here if this is your input image and you compute your x and y derivatives so this is something which you will get and here we can see that uh, this is kind of giving you the horizontal edges which are present in the input image and this one is uh, giving the vertical edges and this is uh, using a Laplace operator, which is kind of double derivative. We are also going to cover this uh, in today's lecture. Okay, so with that background, le uh, let's directly jump to a privet edge detector. And we already saw the steps which are required to compute uh, edges using this algorithm, but let's quickly go through uh, all these steps one by one. You will have your input image. The first step is you will perform smoothing in, let's say, x direction. and which is going to give you a blurred image okay you know that mean we have uh, we have seen this earlier as well like smoothing of your signal actually helps you in detecting edges then you will compute a derivative in x direction which will give you edges in the x direction similarly you will repeat the same step for the uh, y-axis and again in this case you will smooth uh, a long y-axis which will give you blurred image you will compute derivative in y direction so it will give you like edges in y direction and you can then combine these two together to get like the derivative map now if you look at like the filters which are used in this algorithm uh, we have all ones uh, which is going to smooth your image and for derivative you have a one and negative one so this mask we have seen before this gives you edges in the x uh, in the x direction all right so one way is you can actually first perform smoothing using this filter filter and then you can perform like the you can uh, you can operate this derivative mask on this blurred image to get the edges 
The other way, which is like optimized version is you don't have to perform two different steps. You can actually combine these two filters as a single filter. And then what you can do is just use this filter on the input image. And that is going to give you edges. Right? So this is also you have seen like the associative property of uh, convolution or correlation, right? So if you are operating, uh, if you are like uh, using two different filters on the image, you can actually combine the filters together to actually perform filtering and then use that filter on the image. So we, we studied those properties in one of the lecture and this is exactly doing the same. Now you will think about like uh, how we can actually get this filter using these two filters. And basically it, it seems non-trivial, but if you just take like paper, paper, uh, paper and pen and you just take maybe one of these as image patches and the other as a filter, and perform this filtering operation, you are going to get this filter. You might get like a slightly different, I think the direction will be different. Instead of one over here, it will be uh, all negative. And instead of all negative ones, it will be all ones, but th that doesn't matter. I mean, we have, we have talked about that. It doesn't matter whether you use forward, uh, forward difference or backward difference, the result is not going to change. Okay, so the idea will be what you will do. Let's say you consider this as your image patch and this as your filter. And which, which seems like an obvious choice because this is like a smaller uh, smaller dimension filter. So in that case, what will happen is first you will have to perform padding on this patch. All right, so padding we studied, I think in one of the lecture where uh, you have to perform filtering and you have the edges. So how to deal with that. So in this case, let's say you put like uh, all zeros in the border and then that will give you like a bigger patch. And then you will be able to put this filter on each and every location in this in this input uh, image patch. And after performing filtering, you will uh, exactly get this filter, okay? So if you, you can you can try like that, that, that is a homework. Uh, if you have any questions, any doubt, we can, we can take those later. Similarly, you can perform the same set of steps uh, in the Y direction. So in this case, your smoothing operator will be uh, again, all ones. So this, kind, this kind of a variation of a box filter. And again, this is the uh, derivative mask in Y direction. And uh, you can, in fact, perform these two steps as a single step, just using this filter. Okay, so that was Privet Edge Detector. So will Edge Detector uh, exactly the same uh, set of steps? You have image, you perform uh, smoothing, that will give you blurred image, derivative in X, same for Y. The only difference is the filter which you're using to perform smoothing. The Privet Edge Detector actually uses a box filter where all the values are one which means that it's actually giving equal weightage to all the neighborhood pixels. In this case, we are actually giving more weightage to the current location, all right? And the derivative mask, it, it remains the same. And again, if you use, uh, if, you, if you try to combine these two, you will get this filter, because, which again, you can just use a one single step to perform Sobel edge filtering. Same is true for bi-direction, okay? So it's the same derivative uh, filter, but the smoothing operation is slightly different. Instead of having all ones, instead of having box filter, we have this kind of weighted filter here, which is giving more weightage to the current location. Okay, so that was Sobel Edge Detector. Now let's uh, try to cover the rest of the steps, uh, how you can actually determine whether it's an edge or not. So it's pretty straightforward. You have the input image, you know, uh, you have these filters, you don't have to perform them, uh, all those steps separately. So just apply this, you will get like derivative in uh, X direction. And this is going to give you derivative in Y direction, which means to say like edges in X and edges in Y direction. Then you can compute the magnitude of those edges. All right, you know that if you have to compute derivative in an image, uh, we, we, we just revised today, like how you can compute the magnitude. So you just square the values and take the square root. So you will do this for all the pixel locations. And then you will have to set some threshold, which will say that, okay, if the magnitude of the gradient is greater than this value, it's an edge. If the magnitude is lower than this value, it's not an edge. So it's basically just a thresholding and you will have to do this manually. Uh, there are ways to automate this process, which we will uh, talk about, I think later in one of the later lectures. But right now, I mean, just assume that you have to set this uh, manually and that's going to give you edges. Now let's look at like a simple example here. Let's say if this is your input image, if you compute your derivatives in X direction 
uh, that's the output. If you compute uh, derivatives in y direction, you will get something like this. And then you can compute magnitude, which means to say for each pixel, you will actually square the value in corresponding uh, these maps, take the square root, and that's going to give you just one single map. Okay, so that's the step. And once you have this, then you can see that like some of the pixel values are actually pretty high and some are pretty low, and most of these are black. So the dark pixels are actually a uh, background, which means that there is no edge. The, the brighter pixels are saying there was there was definitely an edge. And then in between, we have this like the gray region, which is kind of, it could be an edge, it couldn't be an edge. So that's where the threshold, uh, threshold play a very important role. And depending upon what threshold you use, your edge detection uh, result will uh, differ. For example, if I say the threshold is 100, and this threshold is uh, on these activations here, so you will get something like this, which is showing you the edges which are being determined by this algorithms. Okay. Now, how this threshold will change the output? If you lower the threshold, then you will actually get more edges. And if you increase the threshold, the number of edges which are detected will be uh, slightly lower. Now we have seen this uh, plot earlier. This is the way, like one of the ways uh, to uh, to evaluate the performance of your edge detection algorithm. And this green dot over here, it's a uh, human performance on this uh, data set. And uh, if you look at this, like the Sobel and Privet, I think we briefly covered uh, this on the last, last lecture as well. So they are almost at the same time, uh, 68 and uh, 70, uh, but the performance is almost similar, 0.48 and 0.48. Okay. Let's talk about mar hildreth edge detector. In this case, we are going to make use of second derivative. So far, we have seen uh, the use of single derivative only. And for when we are using single derivative or first derivative, we saw that we were looking for maxima and minima. Wherever we have like a peak or a dip, we were saying that, okay, that's an edge. And if you look at this uh, sample plot from like one of the previous slides, uh, we can see that there is a there are like two edges here in, in this signal. And if we represent that as a one-dimensional function, it will look something like this. And if you compute like a, a first order derivative of the signal, this will be the output response. Okay, and I think we have uh, gone through like how we got this curve. Let me know if you want me to go uh, through this again. And similarly for this, we'll get something like this. And in this case, you can see we are looking for these peaks and these dips. So we know there is an edge over here and there's an edge over here. And these two peaks are, uh, or dips are corresponding to these two edges. Now, in case of second derivative, so what will happen is you will first compute the first order derivative, then you will again perform first order derivative of this first order derivative that will give you second order derivative. And it will look something like this uh, on the bottom. In this case, what's going to happen, instead of looking at peaks and uh, uh, these reverse peaks, you'll have to look for zero crossings, all right? So what zero crossings mean is whenever your signal is actually crossing the zero value or the, the axis at zero. Okay, so in this case, we can see there's a zero crossing over here, which corresponds to this edge. And there is a zero crossing over here, again, which corresponds to this edge. All right, so now we move from looking for maxima minima to looking for zero crossings and that's the only difference and of course there are like more steps to compute so let's directly jump into the steps we have in a mar hildreth edge detector the first step is obvious like we want to smoothen out the image and earlier we were using a box filtering or an average filtering uh, in this algorithm uh, the inventors use gaussian filter and then they applied laplacian to approximate the second order derivative Okay, this is a widely used operator. We'll quickly uh, go over this, uh, what this operator is. And this is kind of uh, approximation of second order derivative. Once we have that output, we will uh, try to find zero crossings. And the idea is again, we will do in both directions, uh, in X direction and Y direction to find these. And once we have those, we'll say, okay, these are the uh, identified edges. Okay, so these three are the main steps in this algorithm. Gaussian smoothing, you already know, I think we have covered this a lot. You will have your input image, you will have a Gaussian filter. You can just perform this, uh, perform this filtering operation. And you know that like this is a Gaussian, uh, 2D Gaussian curve. This is the discrete form. 
this is the actual filter we use. And that's the standard Gaussian equation uh, for two-dimensional uh, filter. Now to compute the uh, Laplacian, what we do is, given the Gaussian, two-dimensional Gaussian is, we actually compute second order derivative, and this is partial uh, second order derivative in x direction. And this is like the, again, partial second order derivative in y direction. And we just add these, okay? So this is like how we uh, compute the uh, Laplacian. So uh, be careful about like these symbols uh, because we have seen that uh, the inverted is actually used for gradient, right? That's how we represent this when we compute two dimensional gradient. So that's different from this operator, which is kind of second order derivative. So the difference is like the dimensionality and the order of derivative, and it's just flipped. Right, so let's now, let's now try to understand what this zero crossing is. So we can have four different variations for zero crossings, and zero crossing is basically whenever your signal is crossing that axis, all right? And the signal might go from a positive value to a negative value. Again, the signal might go from positive to negative, but you might have a value at zero as well, and you can have just the reverse, right? You can go from negative value to positive value. And again, you can go from negative to positive value and also have a value at zero. So these four different conditions we will see uh, when we try to find these zero crossings. Now, since we are operating in discrete steps, so everything is discretized, right? We are not using continuous signals when we are performing filtering. So what we can do is we can compute the slope of zero crossing. And if we have a zero crossing like A and negative, negative of B, we can just add these two values, a plus b. And if you take the magnitude, that is going to give you the slope. And the intuition behind this is, since the space is discretized, so when you are moving from value a to b, okay, so this is the function response. But if you will look at the domain, since this is discretized, you are actually moving in one step. Okay, it might be going from zero to one, or one to two, whatever it is. The difference in uh, difference in domain is going to be one. And if that's the case, then you know that how to compute a slope. Slope is just like your, your movement in the y direction, in the y-axis, that, that you can call like delta y, and your movement in the x direction, that you call delta x. So usually the slope is given by delta y over delta x, and your delta y is essentially adding these two values, a plus b, and your delta x is equals to 1 because you're moving like in, in unit steps. And that's how you can compute like slope of a zero crossing. All right. So if you have to mark like whether it's an edge or not, you just compute the slope of the zero crossing. And it's kind of giving you like how fast the signal is changing. If it's changing like very fast, then it will have a very high slope, like a, like, like a very vertical edge, right? And if you, if you try to reduce the slope, then it's kind of reducing the value, right? So it's kind of still, the, uh, still a zero crossing, but not a very high magnitude. So what we do is we try to, determine whether it's a zero crossing or not based on the slope of uh, this zero crossing itself. Okay, so now if you, if, you, if you think about this, earlier we thought, okay, now we have zero crossing, then it might be better than finding the maxima and minima. That's not the case. Because even if you compute single derivative, you still need a threshold to say that whether this is a maxima or minima, whether it's an edge or not. And the it's the same situation here, even if you compute a double derivative or a Laplacian, we to be able to say that whether this zero crossing is an edge or not, you still need a threshold on the slope. So if a slope is not very high, you will say it's not an edge. Okay, so that parameter is actually not changing when we move from single derivative to second derivative. All right, so let's see how we can uh, compute this Laplacian of Gaussian. This is also called a uh, LOG operator. Uh, so what will happen is, uh, this is your Gaussian, this is your input image, you perform filtering, and this is your LOG operator. And you know like this is uh, associative, or you can say commutative. You can first perform, like you can compute the Laplacian of your Gaussian first, and then you can filter, uh, filter the image. So again, you are trying to save some steps here. And your, uh, this is your like two-dimensional Gaussian. And if you compute the, uh, the Laplacian operator, um, again, this is going to be the uh, equation. I'm not going to go through this. Okay, so that's fine. It's not important for this course whether you understand like how to go from this point to this point. Just understand like uh, what 
uh, what Laplacian of Gaussian is. So I think that that's sufficient. Okay, so if you don't understand how to go from this step to this step, that's that's fine. Now this uh, you have seen like how your uh, Gaussian kernel looks like, and this is like what your Laplacian kernel will look, uh, will, will look like. Okay, so this is kind of an inverted hat, and uh, if you just flip it, like it will be like a giant hat. And if you look at this, it's kind of the the value of this kernel is actually zero. It's slightly increasing, and then it's it's suddenly going down. Okay, and then again going up. So it's kind of symmetrical as well. And this is basically like when you try to plot this equation, you will get something like this. But of course, for filtering, we can't use this. We'll have to discretize this. We'll have to get discrete values. So I will show you like what uh, those discrete values look like. Okay, so for normal edge detection, you know that, uh, that like you will have uh, a signal like this. There might be some noise, and you can perform like smoothing. So this is like uh, already like computed uh, derivative on your Gaussian filter, and when you apply it on that, uh, on that, yeah, it's going to give you this edge. And again, as we have discussed earlier, you find like maxima or minima to determine whether it's an edge or not uh, for uh, one for for first order derivative. But for LOG operator, it's different. You'll have to find the uh, zero crossings. And this is like uh, a two-dimensional like LOG filter. Okay, so if you if you quickly check these values, similar to like your uh, Gaussian or filtered Gaussian operator, you can see that the border values are actually close to zero. And the idea is you don't want to pay too much attention like to the uh, distant values, which are far away from the center. And one interesting uh, pattern you can look is, it's very close to zero, but as you come closer to the center, it's actually slightly rising. So it's roughly uh, 0.1, but then again, it's going negative, right? So there's a huge dip at the center. And if you if you visualize like the inverted, um, the Mexican hat I showed you, this kind of resembles uh, that, that visualization, because at the center, we had a huge dip. But before going from positive to complete dip, we do have some small positive values. All right. So that's fine. Now let's quickly see like how we can optimize like some of these steps. And I think there was a good question from one of the students uh, in today's office hours. We, we talked about how we can separate like a 2D Gaussian into two different one-dimensional Gaussians. We didn't cover that uh, earlier, but let me quickly go through this uh, now. So if you look at like the Gaussian equation, which is shown here on the right top. Okay, so this is like a two dimensional Gaussian equation. And if you remember like from your high school maths, you can actually break this exponent into two different terms, right? Because this is an addition here. So in, if it's like exponent, you know that addition converts to multiplication. So you can actually separate these two x's. So you can first have like the x square term and then you can have the y square term. So you can, you can kind of separate uh, these two. And the idea is, if you have to apply a 2D Gaussian to filter an image, usually you have a two-dimensional filter, but what you can do is you can actually first just filter in the X direction. And then you can filter in the Y direction and the result is not going to change, okay? So if you, if you look at like how much that is saving you in terms of computation cost, if you use a two-dimensional Gaussian filter, then at each location, you, you will have multiplications, like number of multiplications, which is equal to number of values you have in your filter. For example, if your filter is five cross five, okay, so N is uh, size of the filter, then for each location, you will have 25 different multiplications. Okay, and of course there are additions, so let's ignore addition, it's not very computationally expensive. So then the complexity is kind of n square, if you, if you look at big O. And of course you have to do that uh, for every pixel location, but let's not worry about that. Let's just worry about one operation. Okay, so that's kind of n square. But if you break this down into two different uh, Gaussians where like you perform filtering independently in x and y direction. So the idea is you first perform filtering in x direction and then you perform filtering in y direction. So in this case, what will happen is, if you look at this filter, this is this is like one dimensional filter. So if the size is n, then you only have n multiplications, right? So this operation here of filtering will be of order order n. 
And once that is done, again, if you have to filter, again, this Y is a different direction, but again, this is one dimensional filter of size N that is also going to give you like N uh, multiplications. And if you compute the complexity, that's just going to be two N. So it's a big difference. Uh, but if you think carefully, if you're using a very small kernel, let's say three cross three. So this is going to be nine and this is going to be six. So it's not huge difference, but still some, sa uh, some saving in terms of computation uh, steps. But if, if n is huge, let's say five, this is going to be 25 and this is going to be 10. So you see like as the kernel grows big, you, you are saving a lot. All right, so we, we have already seen uh, what like a two dimensional Gaussian kernel looks like. If we break it down, uh, this is going to be like your Gaussian filter in one dimension. And again, I think we have seen this as well. So in this case, this is like G1 and this is G2. Now that was for a uh, uh, two-dimensional Gaussian. We can do something similar for LOG operator as well. Okay. So for Gaussian, I think it was easy to interpret. Uh, for LOG, it's slightly uh, complicated. Again, we are not going to go through the theorem for this. That might take uh, another lecture, so we don't want to do that. Now, but if you look at like your uh, Laplacian operation here, of course you can first perform uh, just on the Gaussian filter. And so that step is fine because it's kind of associative. Uh, we, we know that, all right? So this converts to this, which is good. Now let's break down this into like independent filtering operations. So since this is like second order derivative, it's slightly complicated. And th this turns out to be something like this. Okay, so we are not going to go through like how we go from this step to, to this step. Of course, if you're interested, I can uh, point you to like the, uh, the to the exact theorem. But of course, that's not required for this course. Okay, let's try to just understand what these steps are. So in this case, what uh, we are getting at is we are computing partial derivative in y direction and then using that for filtering. And then we are just computing single order derivative in x direction for forming filtering. Okay, so that's the first step. The second step is again, we are computing second order partial derivative in X direction. And this is just single step derivative in Y direction. So these, these are like two step of filtering operations and we just add these two values. So this will again require N square multiplications because it's a 2D kernel. But in this case, again, all of these kernels are one dimensional. So it's just four times N. Okay, so it's kind of saving a lot of computation power. So if we look into the steps of uh, the complete edge detection uh, algorithm. You will have your uh, image. You will compute a uh, Gaussian filtering in x direction and Gaussian filtering in y direction. That's going to give you i times g. So that was separability of Gaussian filtering. Now for Laplace, what's going to happen is given an image, first you will compute Gaussian filtering like uh, in y direction, then in x direction, and again in x direction, y direction. The subscripts over here, these are like uh, the the order of derivative. So this is second order derivative. This is also second order. Okay. And you just add those values. That's going to give you Laplace in of your uh, of your image. Okay. So let's quickly go over the algorithm. You just compute the uh, the the LOG, the filter uh, the filtering uh, filter filtered image using LOG operator. So you have two options. You can either use the two D filter which I showed you. Or you can use like four different 1D filters and you can follow the steps which I showed you in the previous slide. Okay, for this, you will need like these four different values. But of course, like uh, computing these values is just one, uh, one step process. You don't have to repeat this again. So that doesn't count towards uh, the computational complexity. So that's the first step. And it includes everything like smoothing your image and finding double order derivatives. The second step is how to find zero crossings from the rows and columns and how you find the slope of each zero crossings okay and then you apply the threshold so these are like the four steps which we require for performing edge detection now let's quickly go through uh, the same image we had okay this is something which you get from uh, the laplacian operation so the compute laplacian of gaussian and then you perform filtering on images and you find zero crossings it's going to give you something like this all right, and zero crossing again, as I told you, like you will have to, you will have to set a threshold to be, to 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 be able to say that whether this is this is an edge or not. Okay, now this I think we have slightly covered uh, previously uh, as well when we were talking about filtering. But 
what is the standard deviation of the Gaussian you are using that affects a lot like in your in in the in the output of your edge detection and the it, it the the intuition remains the same if the standard deviation of a Gaussian is pretty low which means you will focus more on the center or the current filter it will give you like a lot of fine-grained edges and as you keep increasing like the standard deviation of the Gaussian which means that uh, so when you're increasing your uh, standard deviation you are moving your Gaussian will be like this for sigma equals to one and then it's going to go like this so you are widening your Gaussian right which means that initially you were paying more attention at the current uh, pixel value but as you increase the uh, standard deviation you're actually paying more attention to the neighboring pixels and if you do that then you are kind of getting coarse level edges you can increase it further the edges will be coarser okay so that's how the the standard deviation of a Gaussian affects the kind of edges you will determine in your input image. Okay, so the next part uh, of this lecture is scanning edge detection. And let's quickly go over the steps uh, we have uh, in this uh, edge detector. Same, same as like the previous uh, algorithms, we will first smooth the image. And again, we are using Gaussian filter here. Then we are using first order derivative uh, to find the edges. Like in Mar Hildreth, we saw second order derivative, but again, we move back to say single order derivative. Then the next step is we find the magnitude, which again, we did for Sobel and we did for Privet as well. Now, this is something new. We will also rely on the orientation of the gradient. All right. So this we know how to compute it. Then these are additional steps we have not uh, seen before in the, in the prior algorithms. So orientation is the first, then the second is non-maximum suppression. We will talk about what non-maximum suppression is. And then again, we will uh, apply thresholding, which we have done before as well, but this is slightly different. I think a better version of uh, thresholding. And this is called hysteresis thresholding. We will also talk about this. Okay. So basically, uh, the first two steps remains the same. This we have seen. So partially, we know the third step as well. These three are the additional steps, and we'll go into more detail of, of these steps. Now, this is like, let's say your input image, and this we know is like uh, the, the, this is like derivative, first order derivative of a Gaussian filter. Again, this is just visualization uh, of the smooth filter, which will look something like this when you look from the top. Okay, so this is an X direction, this could be in Y direction. And again, so this is interesting, right? So filtering, we, we we discussed this earlier as well. It's kind of pattern matching. So whatever pattern we want to see in your input image, we use the same pattern in your filter. And this you will see like over and over again, even when we talk about uh, convolution neural networks, there also we will see that uh, it's all about pattern matching. And so if you look at this, this is kind of going from very bright pixels, pixel to very dark pixel, right? And that's exactly what edge looks like you go from like a very negative value to a very positive value your values are changing right values are changing so the filter actually looks like that and if you're using such a filter it means that it's trying to find pattern like this in your input data and of course this is like you can see uh, the vertical edges and this is the horizontal edges and that's why like using these two different derivative kernels or you can say gaussian kernels help you in finding edges in different different directions Okay, so the these are again the same steps we have seen earlier: input image, x derivative, y derivative on the smooth smoother image. Nothing new, and this uh, is the magnitude. Uh, this also we have seen. So this is basically similar to your private uh, edge detection or Sobel edge detection. All right, so we won't go into detail of this. This is something new. So once you have these edges, what we do is we try to find the orientation of the edges which means like in which direction uh, we have edges in the input image, all right? So this is just one visualization and essentially what's happening at each pixel location, we are trying to determine in which direction the edge actually lies. We're trying to find the orientation and you know the formula to, to compute that, okay? So if, if you try to understand this visualization, we have actually used uh, a color for each direction. Right, because you have like, let's say 360 different directions and you can easily assign like one color to each direction. It could be a smooth 
uh, smooth map or something, color map or something like that, right? So if you look at this, uh, the red color is actually looking at all the 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 edges which are tilted towards left, right? So you can see like this is red, and these are like slightly red. This is also red, right? So all the edges in this direction. So which means that it's kind of giving a sense of in which direction the edges are actually placed in this input image. All right. And again, so that's red. And again, blue, you can see is like all the edges towards the right. Now, how we get these values? So this is just color coding. So you have the orientation of each pixel and you use the color from, from a dictionary or a color map and just plot that. So it's just visualization. But how you get that orientation, you, you know like the formula of, let's say, tan inverse uh, fx over fy or fy over fx, right? You can just use that formula to get these orientations at each location. So that's the first step. Now, the second step is non-maximum suppression. And the idea here is, what you want to do is, you want to look in a, in a local neighborhood, and for each location or each pixel in your input image, you, you want to say that whether the magnitude of this edge is actually greater than the neighboring pixels or not. So if the magnitude is greater than, then you say that it's an edge. So which is kind of you're saying if it's a peak or not. So if it's a peak, then this value will be higher than all the other values in the neighborhood, right? Then you say it's an edge. If it's not, you say it's not an edge, irrespective of whatever like magnitude you have. Now there is a catch. When you look into the neighborhood, you only look into the orientation of the edge. So if you're, let's say your edge is, in uh, has this orientation right so you will only look in this direction for example let's say we are interested in this pixel location q what we will do and this is the direction we will just draw this and we'll try to find the magnitude of h at the neighboring values okay and we'll compare this value with this values and if the magnitude at this location is higher than these two r and p we will say Q is an edge. Now, sometimes it may happen because this is not a continuous space, it's a discrete space. In this orientation, you might not have any pixels. So in that, that case, what you will do is, you will try to interpolate this value using the neighboring pixels of that location, right? So in this case, R, you will get, it could be like a weighted average of this pixel and this pixel. Similarly, P will be a weighted average of this pixel and this pixel. And then you will compare value of P and Q and QNR. And depending upon what the result is, you will say Q is an edge or not. Okay. So let's try to visualize this. Uh, if this is your edge, then orientation will give you something like this. Okay, so the orientation is not like where the edge is uh, inclined towards, it's always, it's giving you the normal. All right. So let's make this discrete. And in this case, if these three are pixel values, uh, x dash, y dash, x, y, and x double dash, y dash. So at this location, what you will do is you will call this, this as an edge only if the magnitude of your first order derivative is greater than x dash, y dash, and x double dash, y double dash. Otherwise, it's not an edge. So that's like a very, very simple uh, rule here. Okay, so it's just saying that what I, what I explained. Okay, so let's uh, see like how uh, the edges will change. This is a before non-maximum suppression. And after suppression, you can see what it actually doing is it's actually thinning your edges. Okay, so if you, if you focus on like edge of this cap over here, in the original uh, version, you can see like it's kind of thick, but what this non-max suppression is doing is it's making it thinner. So what happened is because this is the edge direction, so the normal will be in this direction, right? So if you if you look at look at this direction, then only one of the pixels will be called an edge. You will suppress all the others. Okay, so that's like uh, one additional step we have in Kenny edge detection. Now we have one more step which tries to use like some kind of threshold to suppress further step further edges, like which are not uh, real edges. And this is called hysteresis thresholding. The idea is instead of having a single value of threshold, we have two different values. 
so that that gives us like some kind of bandwidth okay so we call these uh, lower threshold and higher threshold now let's try to understand how this hysteresis th uh, thresholding works so what we will do is let's say the x axis is just like different pixel locations in your uh, in your in your image and this is the gradient magnitude okay now let's say your low threshold is somewhere around this the blue line and higher threshold is somewhere around this line earlier when you had just one threshold then you just use it and anything which is above it you will say edge anything below it you say non edge but this is slightly different so there are three steps the first is you will look at the lower threshold and any pixel of magnitude which is lower than this lower threshold you will say that's not an edge you will you will completely ignore it okay so that's clear then you will look at the higher threshold then you will check the values if the value is greater than the higher threshold you will say it's an edge okay so those two steps are pretty clear it's standard like from the previous algorithms the interesting part is the central region okay so now the idea is when you think about if you if you visualize your edges in in this image let's say so you can see like there is some kind of connectedness in these neighboring pixels when we are forming an edge so for example this edge over here <clears throat> it's continuous right it's not that like one is uh, one pixel is edge then there is there is discontinuity another is edge we don't have that right so it's a continuous edge and that's the intuition here what we do is we we try to find like those connected components in the in the edge map and if there is an edge like edge mean like all the connected pixels if all the connected pixels are below this threshold high we say it's not an edge so this is kind of a weak edge but if we find there is an edge in which like some of the pixels are actually above high and some of them are below high so we will discount them and we will say that okay this still discounts as an edge so we discount all these pixel values pixel locations and instead like mean they were uh, lower than the higher threshold still we are counting them as an edge okay and of course like if the whole edge is like above this side that's definitely an edge and if the whole edge is like below this uh, low that's not an edge okay so this is just these are just the, just the steps like which i uh, briefly explained in the previous slide now one interesting question here is when we're trying to find like the connectedness of the pixels whether like those are neighbors or not there are different ways to do that we can have four connectedness like if we are looking at this pixel value uh, so if if they are connected like in this neighboring way like left right top and bottom we say they are connected so this is like four connectedness this is eight connectedness and we have to do this because we have a discrete space it's not continuous right and we can have like other variants like maybe in the diagonal or in the other diagonal which is fine okay so the idea here is let's say you have this pixel you, it will have some kind of magnitude you have this pixel some magnitude and if these are neighboring pixels then you can say like they belong to the same connected component okay so if we if you use like that uh, hysteresis thresholding on top of non-maximum suppression you can see like this is a much nicer result uh, we have seen uh, so far okay much better than all the other algorithms so this is kind of suppressing all the non-negative edges now as we saw the effect of gaussian kernel on uh, mar hildreth the same effect will be uh, seen here if this is an original image let's say if you use a standard deviation of one you will get something like this you can see like we are still able to detect these fine level edges here and if we increase the standard deviation which means we are looking at a bigger neighborhood so these fine grained edges are actually being disappearing and we are getting like a bigger high uh, like a coarse level picture okay so again it depends like what kind of edges you are interested in if you really want to detect like these fine grained edges use a gaussian kernel with a small standard deviation if you're not interested in fine grain uh, fine grained edges you want like just a coarse level picture what's the like high level structure of this image then you can use like a high uh, standard deviation 
Okay. And of course, these are like traditional approaches. These days we have many like advanced deep learning algorithms to detect edges, which gives you much uh, better performance. Even like some of the recent, and these are not recent methods. I think these should be from 2017 or 18. I don't exactly remember, but you can see like they're already matching the human level performance. Okay, later we will see like if we are fast enough to cover all the topics and we have time, we will try to touch upon uh, this aspect.